How do tiny cups and tanks affect betta fish? I spoke with Dr. Naomi Clark Shen, lead researcher of a 2024 study called Life Beyond a Jar, to learn more. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you for having me. So excited. It's such a fangirl of your page. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so can you first explain what were the goals of this study? Like, what were you hoping to find? Yeah, so um, so I grew up in Singapore and um, there was this fish shop near my house. And as a child, me and my dad would always go there and we saw these better fish being sold in cups. And I think it's crazy that 20 years later, nothing has changed to improve their welfare. Um, so as an adult in Singapore, I was getting really frustrated about this every time I saw it in fish shops and pet shops. And so I looked into the laws um, around this. And the Singapore pet shop law states that fishes must be kept in tanks of adequate size. And that's it. And the problem, of course, there is that if they haven't got the information to say what an adequate size is, then they cannot have a law around it. So we thought that um, if we could do research to try and prove what an adequate size is, that might be the most effective way to change laws and policies around this. Can you explain how the experiment was set up and conducted? Yeah, so we had um, 13 fish total, which is actually a very small amount, but we wanted to use as few fish possible for the research, just from a, a welfare standpoint. We didn't want to put too many fish through the experiment. So we basically purchased these 13 fish in a cup this size, and then they went through um, five different tank conditions. So they were placed in a jar, which is 1.5 liters. They were placed in a small tank, which is 3.3 liters. A medium tank, which was 5.6 liters. And then the last tank was a, a larger one, which I, I don't have, but it's 19.3 liters. Um, and for that, we had um, one with furniture and one without, so a barren one, as well as one with furniture to examine the effect of furniture and no furniture. So basically fish spent seven days in each of these tank conditions. And on the seventh day, we recorded their behavior um, so that they had time to acclimatize and, and get used to the tank. The exception for this was the large barren tank. We only kept them in that for three days and recorded on the third day, just because we felt like their welfare was quite compromised in the barren tank. And when you have barren tanks, there are issues around water quality and, you know, that can kill fish or give them diseases. So we just felt like three days in the barren tank was the cap that we wanted to do before recording their behavior. Um, and so basically, if a fish behaved negatively in any of these treatments within the first 10 minutes of being put in them, they were exempted from that tank trial because we didn't want to put any fish under unnecessary stress. So that actually happened to two fish of the 13. For one of the tanks, they reacted too negatively that we actually removed them from, from the trial um, and put them in a big tank with plants so they felt better. And so basically we then watched the video recordings back and recorded every single behavior that they ex they displayed on those recording days um, and analyzed that behavior to see where they were behaving more positively, where they were behaving more negatively. And then after this, all the fish were rehomed and we had conditions for the adoption, like they had to be in a really large tank with plants and everything. So I'm very happy to say they all went to really loving homes after this study. And when you say furniture, is that that's like enrichment, like plants and hiding spots? Yeah, so real plants, uh, not, not fake plants, because, you know, I don't think fake plants are good for fish or in aquariums at all. So we had real plants, gravel, as well as um, in the large tank, they had like a barrel hideout that they could actually go into. Okay. And what did you learn about uh, their behavior based on the size of the tank that they were in? And then also based on whether or not it was a barren or enriched environment? So fish were more active, so they swam more and spent less time resting in the large tank with furnishings compared to the smaller tanks. Um, so basically that type of activity was, we, we classified it as normal swimming, so it was irregular and that's a very positive behavior. 
But the excessive resting in the smaller tanks like the jar and the small tank size, um, we considered that this was this could be classified as abnormal because, you know, I mean, they were bored, they had nothing to do. So they spent a majority of their time just lying around, which is which is negative. We're not saying all resting is bad, but it, it, it was too much resting, you know. Um, and then in the jar, the small tank and the large tank, which had nothing in it that was barren, they performed more abnormal behaviors. So this included um, stereotypic pacing, which I think a lot of people might be familiar with because we see it a lot in zoo animals. They just do a repetitive pacing motion around their enclosure. And it's well accepted that that represents an inability to cope with their captive environment in some way, um, as well as that interacting with the walls. So fish just swimming into the walls repeatedly, um, which indicates you know, perhaps a feeling of constraint and they wanted to get out of that tank. Um, and then the last abnormal behavior was uh, what we call a hovering, which is where the fish hovers in the water column, but isn't swimming. And they did that a lot in the jar in particular. Um, and we, we believe that really is a behavior indicative of space constraints, that they want to get moving in swim, but they can't. So they just hover in the water column and move their fins. So basically, yeah, in the jar, small tank and the large barren tank, they performed more of these three abnormal behaviors. Um, and this is really interesting because it not only shows the importance of size, but furnishings, because in the large barren tank, they performed more of these abnormal behaviors than in the large tank of furniture. So that shows how stressed fish are when they don't have plants and hideouts and gravel. Right. Yeah, that's, that's so powerful because there's some like animal welfare laws that are very vague and they say as long as uh, the animal can behave normally in their enclosure, but this just completely challenges that and shows that with the current system or the, the common system of keeping them in those cups, they're not behaving normally. Um, so I, yeah, that's really, really compelling. Yeah, and also because I think a lot of people don't even think that fish experience stress so when they just see them behaving in an environment they're like well they're being a fish but this shows that no they do experience stress and you can read the fish's body language and behavior to understand if they're feeling stressed or if they're happy and so i hope that more people start you know fish keepers or fish owners start doing that to really understand the fish that are in their care yeah absolutely and even just the fact that like a few of the fish weren't able to do it shows you know they they have individual personalities and then looking at behavior is is showing that they have um mental states and they can be yes. affected by environment and that's so big for fish because a lot of people don't even think that's uh, a thing that they're capable of so, yeah exactly yeah um and so based off of your findings what are your recommendations for how pet stores should uh display beta fish and also uh, how people should keep them in their homes yeah so in what what we recommended was that pet shops basically we want a ban on the keeping of beta fish in cups and um you know i i, I don't I don't know if they do this over in the US, but in Singapore and some parts of Asia, they even just hang them in plastic bags for people to take. So we want a ban on them being sold in these cups and bags. And the study recommended a minimum size of the 5.6 liter tank, which was the medium one um, for the sale and display. We're not saying that this is an optimal tank and fish are completely happy in this tank. But I think, you know, you have to be realistic and propose something that is more likely to get adopted by the fish shops. And if you tell them that, you know, they have to have a 30 litre tank for every one better fish, it's not going to happen. So we felt that 5.6 litres was a good compromise between what we think the pet shops can adopt and how the fish behaved. Because in this medium tank, they did definitely display fewer abnormal behaviours than in the small tank and the jar. So that's what we recommend. And of course, all of the tanks have to have gravel and real plants and hideouts, um, you know, furniture so the fish feel safe and has spaces to retreat if they're feeling stressed. Um, and at home, we recommend much larger than 5.6 litres. Um, so as big as you're able to provide them, 
um, as complex as you can make the tank with furniture and hideouts and stuff like that. You know, there is a lot that this study didn't look into. We didn't examine depth, how large is too large, if that, if that is a thing and, and stuff like that. So we just recommend much bigger than 5.6 liters and that people pay attention to the personality of their better fish to create an environment which makes that fish happy. Okay. And so, so for store, for retail stores, you recommend 5.6 liters, which is uh, about 1.5 gallons, um, mm -hmm. gravel, plants, hiding spaces. And what about uh, filtration or heating? Do you, are those important considerations? So I think that's really interesting. And that's something that I didn't look into too much. But what I did find, because during our study, we did have filters in some of the tanks for some of the fish. And then we decided to remove them because from my observations, um, the flow created from the filter looked like it made it quite difficult for the better fish to swim because of how large their fins are. I think it's already quite hard for them to swim. And so when you add in a current, it looked like they were struggling to swim. So we actually removed all of the filters um, and the fish seemed better. But when you have very large tanks and a filter, I think that's fine because the current isn't felt as strongly as in a smaller tank. So I, I don't know for sure about filter. I think, again, that comes down to the way that you look after your tank and the way your better fish behaves when you've got the filter on and off. Um, in terms of things like heaters, I think in the US, you guys have to use heaters because maybe when it gets cold, um, obviously you don't want the fish to freeze. But over here in Singapore, we, we don't need heaters. So things like that, we, we didn't experiment with. Okay. Yeah, and I think just if a retail store doesn't have a filter, I mean, which they don't now, they're just in those tiny cups. It's mm. way healthier in terms of water quality if it's a larger water volume, um, like a, a 5.6 liters. So that makes yes. sense. Yes, and, and with the gravel and the plants so that that beneficial bacteria builds up and, and all of that. Right. Um, and so if you could just say in like maybe one or two sentences, what is the main... Um, like the key point that you want people to take away from this study? Yeah, so, okay, I think the first one is that fish have personalities. So our study did prove that all the fish had individual personalities. And I, so I think we should change the way we think about and look after fish. Um, the second is that fish do have the capacity to feel stress. So we need to do whatever we can to improve their lives. Um, and if there's one more thing, I think it's that in no way am I encouraging people to buy fish. I think there's a lot of ethical concerns with how fish are bred, transported, and sold. And so, um, you know, these recommendations are just that if you have a fish, this is what you can do to make their life better. But I think everyone should, you know, adopt Don't Shop to not directly support the industry. Um, and yeah. Yeah, and there's so many, like, powerful points of this study. Like, for me, I think the biggest takeaway was just that you gave an explicit guideline of one, uh, uh, what was it, 5.6 liters or 1.5 gallons, mm. because there's no, um, it's it's this, it's like a benchmark standard that we really don't have, and there's never been that before. And it means so much to be able to point to something that's timely and it's science-backed and say, you know, this is actually being recommended and it's been studied. So I am just so grateful for you and everyone who was part of this. And it's like, I know it's a lot of work and time. So yeah. thank you so much. And I just, I know it's going to be so impactful and it was so needed. It was so necessary. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And, you know, I think we produce the research, but we really depend on people like you and anyone else out there that is an advocate to take this work and use it to actually drive change because we, we can't do all of that. So really grateful for people like yourself that can cite this work and try and make lives better for fish. Yeah. And I will put, um, for people watching, I'll put the, the link to this, uh, to this study in the video description. So definitely take a look at that. Um, thank you again. Thank you.